All right, ladies and gentlemen and others. Um, oh, what are others? I don't know. Uh, just to make sure, um, this one is exquisite. I'm halfway through it. It was published in 2007, Bernard Wasserstein, Barbarism and Civilization. Uh, he knows the names of people and places I've never heard of. I mean, he, he, this, this is so detailed uh, and well put together. Um, now, you've got to have a reading stand for it because it's too heavy, okay? All right, so it, it uh, but as, nar as narrative and analytical history, it's absolutely wonderful. Niall Ferguson, <coughs> The War of the World, uh, also remarkable, and um, what he adds to Wasserstein is his is more global. Hi, how are you? Good, good. His is more global. Uh, so he does more in Asia and things like that. Equally well written, uh, he makes a lot of moral judgments. Um, he tells you things that make it hard to sleep at night uh, because he shares the blame very, very, very widely uh, in terms of things that happened before and during World War II. Uh, and um, it's very, very powerful stuff. How are you spelling that out? Uh, like water, W A S S E R, Wasser, oh, German water, and uh, Steen, S T E I N, and Ferguson. Now this guy is 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 a turkey. He he um, he would be someone like uh, oh Ted Koppel, let's say, or uh, um, any uh, any of the real uh, important uh, Diane Sawyer. Takes a year off, goes all over Europe and writes a book that does two things at the same time. On the one hand, it is a history of the 20th century, and on the other hand, it's a history of the present. So in each place he goes to, he meets the children or the grandchildren of historical actors from the earlier time period, whether they're Wehrmacht officers or whatever, and interviews them, and he intertwines the present and the past in an exquisite way. Okay, it's very, very well written, very well translated. He apparently is one of the great Dutch journalists of of this generation. And this book, it, it's Geert, G E E R T, Geert Mack, M A K, and it's now in paperback also. Here's the book I kept on referring to yesterday but had at home, Modris Eckstein's The Rights of Spring. This is difficult. Uh, a lot of psychocultural history. Uh, he makes some claims that are undoubtedly over the top. But in getting deep below the surface, he brings up issues and questions that are truly, truly extraordinary. So uh, it's very, very much worth looking at. If, if you're really serious about it, it's a challenge. Um, and one of the most wonderful things about Lafayette students, um, I used this about eight, nine years ago for the first time and had to discontinue using it because it was too difficult. And then I began using it about four years ago, five years ago, and students frequently say it's the best book in the class. So the quality of our students has changed so much over the last 10 years well, that from being, <laughs> no, I'm, you're going to get <laughs> yours. I'm roasting you guys tonight. You're getting yours tonight. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, giving, you, I'm giving you an evaluation tonight. Uh, so uh, it's E-K-S-T-E-I-N-S. -E and again, he's written a one uh, powerful book after another. Now, I know that some of these youngsters lecturing uh, have dazzled you with technology and stuff like that, and I can't do that, all right? I, I, I go into every class and I let the students know that I am a dinosaur. Uh, I wanted to look up something, uh, I can't even look up things on the computer, I need a secretary, I need a wife, okay. I have a wife, it's been 46 years, she can do this stuff, I do some of it, I do email, I mean I'm on email, I get email from all over the world, but I'm really, really a technophobe. But I do know how to use, even in the summer, the photocopy machine upstairs. <laughs> you should see what happens when Don Miller comes late before class and he has to photocopy something. He runs into my office, how do you use it? 
I'm glad he's around because he's the only one, well, he's gone beyond me on many, many uh, of these other technical levels, but not the photocopy machine. I'm really, and I, I thought you were doing so well that you deserved some handouts, okay? No, no. So I hope there are enough here. And this is going to be the second part of uh, our discussion today. All right. Here we go. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I was going to say send them across. Okay. I didn't give directions. I didn't give directions. I was going across. How many people are here? We're not over 50. All right. Then there are enough. Then there are enough because I made over 50. Uh, all right. I'm going to, just because you're sitting alone. I'm not going to leave a slot left over there. Uh, they're going to come. Send all the extras this way, please. All the extras going this way. All the way back to uh, uh, Professor Harry Kelleher back there. Um, Bill Kelleher, such a sweetheart. How did you ever get to be a judge? I mean, I, 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 am, I am really happy. Playing cards? You're a good poker player? <laughs> For Dick Sharpless to come in on a day off to see a former student, which he did to see you, is really, really wonderful. Any Do you have any questions from yesterday before we begin? <coughs> <coughs> Who won the war? <laughs> okay. Uh, I answered that yesterday. I said, you have to have a winner, it was America, but I, I, I always say there were no victors. They were equally maimed, and European civilization was the loser, and world civilization was the loser. Um, and then I will always put in that caveat that European self-destruction made it easier for places in which Europe was dominant to achieve their independence so maybe someone sitting in Africa or a Asia was a winner. Okay, it depends how you play it all out. Um, and as an acceleration of history, uh, it certainly got women out of the home more quickly, even though a lot of the gains that they made were taken away after the war uh, by fascist-like and other dictatorial regimes that wanted to go back to a more hierarchical view of society, a more traditional view of society. Uh, but I believe really everyone was a victim and civilization was a victim. And um, one, one of the great tragedies is that um, Europeans never before had so many people lived well at, at that time period. Never before had so many people lived well in Europe. Europe was really, really progressing, but at the same time as progressing, there was a level of cultural sickness when it came to the acceptance of violence and war and manhood and all of those kinds of things, irrationality, the growth of irrationality as part of the modernist cultural moment um, that was at odds with all of this material prosperity that had developed over time and was beginning to seep toward Eastern Europe as well, but far too slowly. But again, that's just Europe. So this Western Europe, Central Europe um, minority part of the world was doing much better as we were in the United States. So no one won in Europe, uh, and the United States emerged at the center of the world um, economically, not yet culturally, but economically and financially. Uh, we were the greatest debtor nation going into the war. We left the war as the greatest creditor nation. The European powers were creditor nations. They all left as debtor nations. And that was one of the issues about the Treaty of Versailles. They had imposed these reparations <coughs> payments on Germany uh, mostly, but some of the other uh, German allies. But uh, all the European countries owed uh, uh, billions of dollars to the United States. And uh, as one president said, well, they loaned it, didn't they? Um, we weren't willing to cancel our debts. We weren't ready for a Marshall Plan. 
we needed a Marshall Plan. We got a Marshall Plan after World War II, partly because we didn't get a Marshall Plan after World War I. And what happened after World War II is that states people caught up with this historical time warp and realized that giving money away to get other people back on their feet was cheap compared to dealing with the savagery that might develop if they didn't get back on their feet. So this was a major step forward in our, uh, uh, in our states, statesmanship. Other questions at all? Don't need to be. I just want to see if anything's hanging over. Pardon? Does that still work? Uh, nothing works everywhere, every time. Everything is knowing the moment. Uh, and someone else asked a question yesterday, which it ties into this, which is, what do you learn from all of that? Well, you learn that there are some generalities, and then, there are, then there's the real world. And you have to always be case specific. So uh, we can't fix all the world's problems. And uh, states, statesmanship is knowing what we can fix and what we can't fix. And then we take our licks and we decide, well, do we really trust these people who we've elected, or do we not trust these people who, who, who we've elected, whose full-time job is to make those decisions. And then if we are uh, out of accord with them, we call them on the carpet. But, um, it doesn't always work, and sometimes it does work. Other questions? Oh, yes, please. It's, it's just uh, a tangential question, but yeah. do you teach the intellectual history of modern Europe? No, I'm around? not qualified to do it. I <laughs> pretend. Is that still around? Though? Um, it is Andy Fix, and he fixes everything. Uh, well, that used to be Dr. Genby. That was G's. I, I, I was the diplomacy guy, uh, and, and, and G was the intellectual history. And, and this is interesting because um, I love intellectual history, but if you're not really, really trained in it, it's extremely difficult. You have to go all the way back to the classics. It's a different, it's, it's intellectual history, cultural history, uh, even, even the other isms that you deal with, the other de departments you deal with are different, like anthropology and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so I, I, do, I do play with it, but I will admit when I'm teaching something that I'm, you know, I, I'm learning it with you, and that's the way we go together. That course is still around. Oh, uh, that course is still around. That's Andy Special Fix. Course. It's two semester course, uh, intellectual history from the from Plato to NATO or something like that. That's all the way downhill. That's a mixed metaphor. Part in Europe is from 1815 to. That's mine. Oh, that's Albert Jandamine right. gave me that oh, course. Yeah, two that's part, 1815 to, to the present. That's, that's, the that's what he gave to me. And then my specialty is uh, modern French history. Uh, modern Jewish history, uh, Holocaust, origins of World War I and World War II. Um, again, I've taught Middle East. I taught the nuclear arms race when it looked real, real ugly in the 1980s. Uh, and I do use a lot of literature in my courses. That's another thing. We use a lot of literature in courses. So in the 19th century course, they will read Jeremy Now by Zola and The Heart of Darkness by Conrad. And, um, and the other thing that we do now is um, I use th sometimes three full volumes of documents in one course. So they may get a set of documents that thick, and a lot of the intellectual history is in those documents. So I'm kidding. Of course I teach it. But it's not, <laughs> not, not as a specialty. And, and uh, you'll find out how little SART I know by the third question. You know. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, well today's comments are going to be divided into two parts. The first is more analytical, and the second, I have to borrow this. I, I, without that, I can't do any, no, I'm kidding, I have my own copy. <laughs> I, I, I do, I, you, you scared me when I saw that. I, I have my own copy, all right. And, and I did that by heart also. You can see how messy it is, it's recent, I did it by heart. Um, the first set of comments are going to be more analytical, and then we'll do a timeline, which is what you have in front of you, and talk about how the developments of the 1930s actually proceeded. And the first part will be more analytical. Um, some of it, uh, recapping some of the things we talked about last class, um, what are the basic structural uh, issues of the 1930s in diplomacy? Diplomacy in the 1930s. How did Adolf Hitler take a downtrodden Germany in 1933 uh, all the way to a dominant, the dominant European power by 1939 without shedding that much blood, 
at least uh, his blood. Uh, the blood of his opponents, yes. But actually, uh, it is one of the most radical diplomatic and military revolutions in world history. Especially considering uh, the fact that Germany was still fairly well demilitarized and its enemies were more militarized and could have stopped him at any number of moments. So we want to look at a number of general themes first and then look at that timeline and, and see where it takes us. Now the first of these themes is that domestic and international issues were intertwined continually. You can't study the foreign policy without studying the domestic politics everywhere and in each particular place. And in terms of the domestic politics laying over from yesterday, uh, the single most important issues were the continued long-term impact of World War I and then the more immediate impact of the Great Depression which struck all the European nations between 1929 and 1933 and without which Adolf Hitler would never have been able to come into power. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about Adolf Hitler. No depression, no Adolf Hitler. He had a political party. It had representatives in the Reichstag, but it only had 12 representatives in a body of over 600 seats. And then it went from 12 to 107 to 230 in succeeding elections, boom, boom, boom. And on the left, the communists did the same thing. And all of a sudden, the middle shrunk. And all you had is the extremes really left uh, because of the depression and the hopelessness of people during that time. Real hopelessness. Uh, you're a class in Germany uh, of graduating seniors at a university. And remember, it's the elites who went to the universities at that time. Um, you know, 60% are going to be unemployed. 40% of all Germans are unemployed by 1933. That's, that's a lot of people. And the unions and the government had very, very finite benefits. So the benefits ran out. I bet many of you know people whose unemployment benefits now have run out and who have had to take early Social Security to pay the bills and it's not funny. It's really, really sad. And this is nothing compared to what it was like during the Great Depression. So whenever you ask yourself, why did Britain do this? Why did France do that? Ask yourself, what was happening in Britain or France during that time period? What was most important to them? And the answer in many cases is going to be local politics and economics. And they just can't get beyond it. They can't see the forest from the trees or the trees from the forest. They just can't focus well because they have so many other things that they're dealing with. The world is divided between the haves and the have-not nations. And especially Europe is divided between the have and the have-not nations. And the haves favor the status quo. They favor stability. Your two most predominant haves are Britain and France. The whole diplomatic system rests on Britain and France. They basically would like things to stay pretty much the same, although they have different opinions with respect to Germany, and I'll speak more about that in a minute or two. But then you're facing on different levels a whole series of irredentist nations, of nations who think they have been wronged, of nations who think they deserve more, and they want to change the status quo. And they want to do that either by negotiation or by force if necessary. Now clearly, <coughs> no Germany 
considering its centrality, its industrial capacity, its population was going to accept the long term, in the long term, the Treaty of Versailles provisions. So I always say it's not whether, it's when. The Treaty of Versailles was going to be changed. They would have had to have renegotiated. Germany could not be kept down. When it was brought back into the family of nations, it was bound to regain some of the losses it had had from World War I. It was, still, it was simply too powerful to be kept down. And even the German states people who favored doing it peacefully favored doing it. So Germany is dissatisfied with its plight, understandably so. Italy under Mussolini is revisionist. And when we get into that timeline, Italy is going to cause a problem. It had already caused some problems in the 1920s, but they were taken care of rather easily. But in the 1930s, it's going to cause a real problem. Because Italy could have been an ally against Germany. The Italians were not pro-German, they had fought the Germans. The Italians did not like the Germans. The Germans did not like the Italians. Okay? But Mussolini's irredentist, overinflated ego, in which he wanted more, more colonies, forced him later into the arms of Hitler. Japan wanted more as well and could not be depended on deeply to preserve the status quo. And some of the things Japan wanted should turn all of us red with shame because Japan wanted a racial equality clause inserted in the League of Nations Covenant. And even Wilson wouldn't accept that, okay, because we were too racist for that. Now, the J Japanese were racist, too, within the Asian sphere, looking down on other Asians. And later, they began to look down on whites also, and on everybody else but themselves. So by the 1930s, the people in power in Japan and most of the military, in some way, were a mirror image not quite as radical, but somewhat of a mirror image of what was going on in Germany at that time. And they were revisionist. And the Russians were revisionist. We talked about the map the other day. Look how nice and fat it is here, and it's trimmed down over here a little bit. A lot, actually. They weren't as irredentist as others, but you couldn't count on the Russians really as yet for the status quo. However, that's just the beginning of it. All these little folks had minorities belonging to their neighbors in their territory, and all these little folks wanted more. So when it came time to pull, a pot, to pull apart Poland, Hungary wanted a piece of Poland. Okay? When it came time to pull apart any of these other states, other small countries wanted part of those states where their ethnic kinfolk resided. Or even if they didn't, they wanted it. Okay? So, uh, you know what a chazer is? What's a chazer? Pig. Pig. The world was full of chazerim. That's the plural of chazer. The world was full of piggish states, all of whom wanted more. Uh, and it was very, very ugly. The powers were divided ideologically and internally. And this is very important. They are divided ideologically. That means within each country, or rather, I'll take the internally first, they're divided internally based on ideology. Each country had domestic problems based on ideological um, radicalization, polarization, especially during the 1930s, during the Depression. Nobody fully accepted Keynesian economics as yet, even though he was writing his major theories and giving advice all the way even into the 1930s. In fact, the head of the British fascist party, Mosley, and it was a very small party, 
accepted Keynesian economics and bolted and became a fascist because the government wouldn't accept Keynesian economics, among a number of other reasons. So there were those on the left, generally, whose response to the Depression basically was, we got to do something more like what our government just did. Somebody's got to get a bailout. And the right wing basically said, no, you just got to lay off people and have balanced budgets. You can't mess with the economy. You got to have balanced budgets. So they laid off people all over the place. They balanced their budgets. They raised protective tariffs, and they made it all worse. So the depression got deeper. Now, in the case of France, the depression came to France late because it had a well-balanced economic structure. We're used to thinking of France as a cripple, but it wasn't a cripple. It was powerful, powerful economically. But it got worse and worse and worse. It was like a whole series of toothaches during the whole 1930s. It tore the country apart. And the people of France were close to a civil war during the whole half of the second half of the 1930s, when they were, should have been in the process of radically building up to face Germany, they were about to tear each other apart because of different ideological drives and understandings, the old class struggle uh, came to the fore again. Internationally, the countries were divided ideologically as well. Now, how did uh, France survive in World War I? What, what's the first thing you want to do if you want to talk about foreign policy or if you want to talk about the origins of a war or the fighting of a war? What's the first thing you're going to do? And my body should tell you. No, I'm not leaving. Eat. Eat. Thank you. Oh, the oh. <laughs> <laughs> This overshirt is meant to hide it. <laughs> you look at a map. You look at a map, okay? How did France survive World War I? Yeah. Trading territory. Giving up part of itself in order, in order to uh, uh, survive. Okay, that's part of it, but that's too intelligent. How does <laughs> look at this? Look at this guy over here. They aligned themselves with Britain. They aligned themselves with Britain, but even more importantly, they aligned themselves with Russia. Democratic France, the most democratic state in Europe, and Tsarist Russia the most conservative state in Europe, and they have an alliance against Germany because they're terrified of German power. That's called realpolitik. What year is this? 19, 1891, 1894, all the way through World War I. Oh, oh, you're all the way through World War I. World That's War. how they survived in World War I, by democratic France and conservative Russia and, and taking off their hats and saluting each other's flags and listening to each other's national anthems and all the rest of that stuff. These were people who would have detested each other politically because this is the most conservative regime and this is the most liberal regime. But the necessity is the mother of invention here to contain Germany. It didn't change after World War I. The map is still the same except that Poland stuck in the middle. The only way somehow to contain a Germany that really intends to go to war is to have an alliance with Russia. The problem is the ideology of the 1920s and 30s of communism was so radical that the French and even more the British feared Russia more than they feared Germany, even though Russia was fairly conservative in the 1930s, diplomatically and very defensive, and Germany is very aggressive and increasingly so. So look at the map. How did you survive World War I? You should go back to doing that, and that's where if you've read The Gathering Storm, the Churchill starts talking about that. By 1935, by 1936, 
He's no lover of Russia. He despises communism. He wants England to survive. He looks at the map, and the map should tell you at least you've got to have a serious agreement with Russia. Now, the French actually had that agreement. They signed an alliance with Russia in 1935. They ratified it in early 36. The British were furious at them for doing it. Furious. And then they didn't implement it. So it was an alliance that wasn't implemented. They understood they needed it. What this is basically is a 300 year step backward into the wars of Reformation Europe in the 16th and early 17th century, in which Catholic fought Protestant and Protestant fought Catholic and gave each other no quarter whatsoever because they each had a utopian view of what life and the future was all about and religion was the ideology of the age and self-interest and rationality was suppressed. This is the return of the Reformation style ideology in which secular ideologies have now replaced religion as the focus of people's thought processes, destroying reasonable discourse and destroying the cap capacity to make secular decisions based on geography. And it was horrendous. In some cases, the documents will tell you when you read them, they even feared the socialist government of France, which was very, very moderate, about the same as FDR in America, with the same kind of program as FDR in America, mild changes. The British preferred the Italian-style government or even the German-style government to lay on bloom in 1936 when he was leading a socialist popular front together with the communists and the French democratic forces. The French communists, who were a pain in the ass, the socialists who were moderate, and the varieties of other democratic forces came together in France in 1935 to prevent fascism from taking control in France. So things were so severe in France ideologically and with the class struggle that they feared what happened in Italy or what happened in Germany would happen in France because there were so many militarized fascist style leagues like many National Socialists or Italian Fascist parties uh, in the 1920s. So this ideological stuff is very, very powerful. The powers are divided constitutionally. You've got lots of dictatorships and um, you've got uh, a few democracies. Who does better in these times of crisis? Dictatorships or democracies in solving problems. Okay. You know, by 1929, Mussolini had really full control in Italy. It took him a long time. He didn't get it so quickly. And he didn't have to worry much after then, especially once he signs the Concordat with the Papacy, okay, which is the most important, lasting thing, the reconciliation between the church and the state from the time of the breakup of that from 1870, 1866 actually, onward, 1870 onward, when, uh, when the, the Italian state captured Rome and took Rome to be part of the Italian state and the Pope was just left with the Vatican. Okay, uh, Hitler had to do that too and he reached a concord with the papacy also in 1933. One of the first things he did is reach an agreement with the church. How is that possible? The church also feared communism far more than it feared Italian fascism or National Socialism. Far, far more. So the dictatorships could get on with um, dealing with lots of the internal problems much more easily than the democracies where opinions were divided and divided and divided. There were 15 different governments in France between 
1928 and 1939. I don't know if the number is 15, maybe it's 13, maybe it's 18. I mean, they, they, they rose and they fall so quickly. Sometimes when major historical changes were occurring, as with the Anschluss, the annexation of Austria in 1938, France technically was in the middle of a ministerial crisis and technically did not have a new valid government. It had a government. People were making decisions, but they were in transition between two different governments. Okay, so uh, this problem of the um, dealing with all of these domestic issues was really very, very extreme during this time period. All had severe domestic problems, but the dictatorships were able to deal with those problems uh, much more readily than the democracies uh, by doing all kinds of other things. In the case of Hitler, he didn't know much at all about economics. The old economists continued to serve him loyally, but he just started putting people back to work. He started building roads and building bridges all over the place very, very openly, very evidently. Um, he started rebuilding the army. He just put people back to work. If the, balance, if the budget was going to be unbalanced, he would take care of it later. So be it. He didn't think in the long, long run. People needed to be employed. He put them back to work. There were lots of people, in fact most people, for whom he was a god, an idol. Until the war began, and even until 1943, he was adored. He was by far the most beloved person in Germany. Even on the part of a number of people who were liberals and Democrats, because he put food back on the plates. It's not that people were doing well or, or great, but they were doing so much better than before, and they had so much security, more security than they had had before, so much more hopefulness than they had had before, that so what if they gave up their civil rights? So what if their neighbors disappeared? It just didn't add up. Okay? Hitler became more and more popular every single year in which he ruled until the Battle of Stalingrad, 1942, 1943 because he was able to deal with those domestic problems and lie to the people that he was a peacemaker. Lie to the people that all he wanted was peace and peace and peace, but peace with justice and dignity for Germany. The world... Can I ask a quick question about Adolf Hitler? How did we view him at that time? Oh, you don't want to know. <laughs> oh, sure. So was Mussolini. All right, I got to run for one of my quotes. Thank you. Let's not even worry about the dumb Americans. No, I didn't say that, the Americans. Uh, let's think about the sophisticated British. David Lloyd George, the British war leader in 1936, when there were concentration camps, not murder centers, but concentration camps all over Germany by that time, all legal activity, all civil rights, everything has been usurped. Lloyd George goes to visit Hitler and he says the following, whatever one may think of his methods, and they are certainly not those of a parliamentary country, there can be no doubt that he has achieved a marvelous transformation in the spirit of the people, in their attitude toward each other, and in their social and economic outlook. I mean, this is, this is the greatest English statesman in the last part of the 19th and early 20th century. We thought Mussolini was fairly cool because he kept those communists and socialists in check. Okay? Roosevelt certainly understood and didn't like Hitler, okay, at all. But how can you do this? And then he adds, the Germans will resist to the death every invader of their own country but they have no longer the desire themselves to invade any other country. 1936. Now, we'll come back to that quote because by that time, and that's a wonderful question, by that time Hitler had already broken three different parts of the Versailles Treaty and the Locarno Treaty which Germany entered into freely in 1925. Okay? So by that time, to make that kind of statement 
is very, very bizarre. Well, Hitler laid it on for David Lloyd George. I mean, some of us want to think of him as a, just a plain monodimensional madman. There was the finest tea. The cookies were better than at Lafayette College. People <laughs> serving everything were... They laid it on for those visitors, an autographed picture of Hitler directly there for David Lloyd George. Could you take pictures of him? But of course, and the th same thing when Chamberlain goes to visit Hitler later. Hitler runs down the steps to greet Chamberlain and he says, oh, I'm so sorry, I should have come to, visit, to England to visit you because you're older than I am. I'm so, I mean, this guy really knew how to play the game. Okay, so he, 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 he is sick. He is a borderline personality, okay? He is demonic, but he is not out of touch with reality. He plays the game. He's a genius politically and in terms of dealing with people. Until he loses that capacity because he decides later, fortunately he decides later, to give up all of those things and just to be himself. And Alan Bullock in his wonderful biography of Hitler talks about the man without his clothes. He undresses during the war, and he says the world will hold its breath. I'm tired of playing games with you people. You're going to see everything I got on the table. I'm putting all my cards out, and you can go shove it. And that's when he defeats himself by overextending. As long as he's playing the game, he's still controlling the deck. And, and that's one of the major points here. Yes? Did he become physically sick, mentally sick? What was, as, as you know, <coughs> you had a bad effect? Yes. Uh, he became physically and mentally more disabled after the July 1944 plot. And at, by that time, when Germany is losing the war, he is being put to bed and awakened increasingly on drugs. So he does become, uh, he does become very, very, very drug dependent at the very end. He does lose touch with reality at the very end. He does maneuver divisions which have already surrendered or been destroyed at the end. And what you want to do is there's a tiny little book by you, Trevor Roper, called The Last Days of Hitler. And it's an exquisite little book. Uh, and it tells you how Hitler lived basically day by day by day. And the film uh, is a very, very good film. The, that, that film on the last, uh, the last months or so of Hitler is historically uh, pretty valid. Uh, so there are, there, there are a lot of cinematic materials on, on this also. Um, other questions? Uh, I still want to stay as much as I can in the, uh, in the guidelines of where I'm going, uh, but, but other questions to take a little break is good if you, if you have any. Anything I've mentioned so far? Well, I think the, the question is, what was the role of the United States at this point? Okay, uh, wonderful, good, okay. What was the role? Of the, uh, as an undergraduate, as an undergraduate, I did a paper uh, on the Rhineland that was going to be my PhD thesis. I think it's the single most important turning point in the 1930s, March 1936. We'll go over it again. Hitler remilitarizes the Rhineland, breaks the Treaty of Versailles, breaks the Treaty of Locarno, and for a moment, there's a question of, will the French go in and stop this? And their army is more powerful than the German army at that time, even alone. Okay? And uh, a number of Hitler's generals at that time were still thinking about trying to get rid of him. He had already accomplished what they wanted. He, he was rearming. Germany had broken the Treaty of Versailles. Everything was, in other words, maybe it's time to take trouble, take it back from him. We gave him the power to fix things up. We gave him the power to break the communists. We gave him the power to break the socialists. We gave him the power to break the democrats. We gave him the power to break the unions. He's done all those things. Maybe it's time to get rid of them. So I read Current History, right? Current History. Alan Nevins, great professor at Columbia University, who wrote an essay in Current History in 1936. And the last line of it was, after all, the Rhineland is only Germany's own backyard. So our view was, it's German territory, let them do what they want with it, and don't get us involved again in any troubles in Europe. And the um, Senate and House were still investigating war profiteering from World War I. Okay, so we wanted, we, we wanted, we wanted out. 
Roosevelt is trying slowly by that time still to, to re-educate the country um, and the predominant um, problem is the depression. Again, the depression and we did not want to be involved with that. We were much more concerned uh, that early still with what Japanese, what the Japanese were doing in Asia uh, and with the Manchurian crisis of 1931 to 1933 and a year later it would get worse because Japan would attack China in 1937, then we were really concerned with Asia. So we were still very, very much in isolation at that time, okay, including our scholarly community. The Japanese threat was there because of the Philippines? Uh, well, not, not as yet. It was there because of China and, and what would happen later because the Japanese Navy was, was growing and growing. Along that, that's the yeah, same point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the German the German general staff. Yes. I, it was I, I found it, it um, a little hard to believe that um, the, that Hitler was able to. Um, oh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe later. <laughs> but, but, um, the the issue where Hitler went took the Reichstag to Potsdam and declared four years of emergency powers. Decrees, yeah. Essentially yeah. establishing yeah, the, the Nazi enabling dictator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, How he, did that get past the... Uh, he, got, he got that, well, okay, so I'm, I'm going I'll, I'll, to, I'll talk, right, no, that's all right. I'll talk about this because it's okay. You're interested in it now. Uh, I would have done it a little bit later. But it, two things, okay. First of all, General Ludwig Beck, Chief of Staff, 1933, I have wished for years for the political revolution, and now my wishes have come true. It is the first ray of hope since 1918. All right, so this guy ends up committing suicide at the end of World War II because of the plot to kill Hitler. But in 1933, that's what he's saying. Single most important thing that Hitler does, June 1934, it's on your sheet with the word knives next to it. That's the night of the long knives, okay? That's when Stalin began to take Hitler seriously as a threat. Hitler has several generals and the leading radicals of the SA, his own stormtroops, murdered that night and takes credit for it politically openly. And he says, someone had to be responsible to set the house in order. So what's the point? The generals were afraid that the SA wanted to take over the army, which it did. And Ernst von Röhm wanted to take over the army. And so Hitler cleaned house. He cleaned house of his own uh, lieutenants, friends of his, supporters of his, for the last decade because they threatened the army. And the, the army really then became more and more loyal to him. 1935, Field Marshal Werner von Blomberg, he got fired three years later, okay? 1935, Blomberg said, the Fuhrer is cleverer than we are. He will plan and do everything correctly. Okay? Now why? Because he's already rearming, he's gotten away with it. He gets away with it. Every single thing he does that works raises his stock because he gets away with it. And all of these people come to really, really respect him more. Yes? Didn't the general staff oppose the uh, militarization of the uh, Rhineland? Yes. And he said go. And they followed it. And they went. And the French did nothing. He had the guts. He had the nerve. We were weak-kneed. Who was governing the Rhineland? Uh, it was part of Germany, but there was, it was uh, demilitarized, okay? In the same way as uh, if there would ever be a Palestinian state on the West Bank, and hopefully there will be, okay? It has to be demilitarized in certain ways. No heavy, heavy stuff, no air force, and stuff like that. And guess what? If there ever is a state, 20 years later, it will have an air force also, because those things don't hold long, okay? But the point is, uh, that was part of the Treaty of Versailles. It was supposed to be permanently demilitarized because that would break French security. And a year after the demilitarization is broken, facing the French Maginot Line is a German security fortress called the Siegfried Line. 
Yes. And then I'm sorry to come back. Don't you think that an, another reason why the democracy is being enacted at the time, the uh, Rhineland and some of the subsequent incidents, was, was not just bizarre and I mean, existed, but uh, the thoughts like Lloyd George's, who by that time was somewhat isolated. And was, yes. And, and in fact, quotes like that dro uh, drove him from being a great hero of Britain to being somewhat alone at the mm -hmm. time he mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't you think it was the, 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 this uh, pacifist effect, that the leftover uh, effect of, of, of the gun and the psalm on, on, on British people and, and, and the French people? I mean, you had the famous uh, Oxford Union sure, the resolution. Right. Uh, this, this house uh, resolved, this house will mm -hmm. not fight sure. for king and country. Right. Uh, uh, I agree with you, and that's why I start out and, and say that the war is the first thing you have to remember. But when we get into the timeline, I'm going to add some other things about the French, which will make it even worse. Okay? We'll make it even worse. Yes. But all these little things that they let Hitler get away with, yes. Uh, was he, was it known or that he depended so much on guile and luck and everything fell his way and he was like, he, he knew that if he did this, that fate almost... He came to believe he was a creature of fate, and fate would save him. You can call that God, he but, wouldn't have... Was he, he was a child of fate. other people already, or this, was he stating it himself as much oh, as he yes. did later? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In 1937, when he tells the German generals that there's going to be a war within the next five years or so, he tells them directly, this is the Hossback meeting in 1937, November, and he says, we must prepare for war in five years, and here are the number of reasons why we must do it, among the most important, which is that I am getting older, and we can't do this without me. <laughs> when was that reported, or how come it's... it's, oh, that, it's a book? I've never, uh, oh, yeah, the Hossback Memorandum. Books, but I've never... Yeah, Hossback Memorandum, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, pardon? Yes, the meeting with the generals, and he says, "You yeah, but guys." But not public too. I mean, somehow. Uh, no, it wasn't public at that point. It was pu public later after the war. But he said, "He said, uh, you guys aren't doing your jobs right." I said, "I want remilitarization. I want economic coordination. I want us to be ready for war, and you guys aren't doing it. And I'll tell you why you have to do it, because within five years or so, we're going to have a war. And part of the reason is I'm getting older." Because we can't have this war without me. He was right. No, he, was, he was right. No, he was in his middle 40s, not that old. Yeah, no, no, but he had, feel, he had concerns about that. Another one of these basic structures is that the world was a mess. It's not just that Europe was a, we a mess, it's that the world was a mess. Uh, the decolonization movement, the empire, Britain and France had world empires which were beginning to become major problems. That was especially true for Great Britain. And the most important thing to them was the empire. And they wanted to maintain the empire, and the empire was beginning to crack. So they had worldwide issues to deal with. How could their navy be strong enough to defeat the growing German navy, which the Germans began to really, really build in 1935, uh, and at the same time be able to cope with the Japanese Navy, which was getting larger and larger. So that really, really concerned them. Empire was a double-edged sword. Empire had really, really helped the British and the French in World War I. The total resources of the empire, or much of those resources, were used by Britain and France to help survive in World War I. But now the empires themselves were beginning to become very, very difficult issues. Where else does this take place? Well, again, we call World... When did World War I start? Or when, when did World War II start? 39. 39. Anyone want to dispute it? Well, if, if you were Chinese, you'd probably say, hell with you guys. I, I speak for 300 million Chinese living in 1937, and Japan attacked us in 1937. So which is the world, China or the West? Okay, so we think in terms of Europe. Okay, did the world war begin in 30, in 39? Did it begin in 37? Did it begin in 31? The world part of the war. Well, the most important date is still 39. But 37 looks awfully bad also, and that's when American policy really begins to change.
and we begin to press on the Japanese. So the world is a mess in Asia, but what about the Italian attack on Ethiopia in 1935? Okay? Now, prior to this time, Italy and France and Britain are working against Germany when Germany begins to remilitarize in 1935. Italy decides to attack Ethiopia. Why Ethiopia? They were insulted in the late 1800s. They lost to Ethiopia in, the eight, in, the, in 1896, right? Okay, they could win, okay? They could win. Well, you know, uh, and, and everyone, everyone <laughs> makes jokes about the Italian army. I, I don't want to. I don't want to line up against the Italian football players in the, on, on our team. Okay, these are big guys, and don't accuse them of of running backwards. They run forwards. Okay. Emperor Menelik of Ethiopia in the 1890s was 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 making fun of all the European powers at that time. They were just as well armed as the Italian army at that time. But Italy wanted to revenge itself of that defeat and also just take more. Okay, the British and the French have this empire. Who ordained that the British and the French are the only ones who have a right to a huge empire? We are Italians. We are the heirs of Roman civilization. We have the rights to an equal empire. Duh. Check it out first and make sure the British and the French will agree with you. You're worrying about Hitler. The more Hitler gained things, the more Mussolini's appetite got whetted. By going to war against Ethiopia in 1935, what he does is make it impossible for the British and the French to still stay with him. They cannot, because of their public opinion, tell their people that this is okay using poison, poisonous gas against natives, using all the World War I and, and, and advanced <coughs> weaponry and airplanes against uh, relatively uh, unmilitarized people. And, and so now Italy is loose. So the world structure itself is so discombobulated that um, the whole environment is polluted. Well, what about the League of Nations? Well, Japan walked out in 1932. The League <coughs> condemned Japan for what it did. Japan said, thank you, goodbye. What's one of the first things Hitler does in 1933? Uh, the British and French won't disarm, especially the French, won't disarm now and bring down their armies to the size of the German <coughs> army. It's nice talking to you. Hitler walks out of the disarmament conference and just to make things good, he walks out of the League of Nations also. Goodbye. What is the League of Nations? We're not in it. Japan is out of it. Italy's been condemned by it. Uh, Germany is out of it. Um, and we're still basically in semi-isolation. So add on to that then, we have um, Adolf Hitler, the man and his policies. Race and space, the man and his policies. The hardest thing to understand is that he was a true believer. I want to bite my lips as I speak. In his own mind, he was a utopian visionary. He was going to build a better world. Karl Marx said that all history is the history of class struggles. Adolf Hitler would have said, all history is the history of racial struggles. And the only thing that matters is race. And the Germans are the superior race. And destiny has given them the right, the opportunity, and even more than that, the necessity to triumph. And if they can't triumph, then let them be lost as well. And the worst part about this is that all of this racist stuff was very much a part of late 19th century and early 20th century thinking. Adolf Hitler did not invent any of these ideas. What he had instead was the demonic belief and the demonic will to implement them. 
there were hundreds and thousands of people who held these kind of beliefs on one level or another after World War I. In Europe, in Japan, in America. The difference being that having been part of a defeated Germany, the vengefulness and need for making good again, breaking Versailles, taking everything made a place for him possible. But even then, most Germans were not part of this in the 1920s. First legal elections in the 1920s. Three parties, Catholic Center, Democratic Party, Socialist Party. 1928, last election before the Depression. Three parties, Catholic Center, Socialists, Democratic Party. 1929 to 1932, 1933, with each succeeding election, more people voted communist, more people voted national socialists. Hitler's party becomes the single largest party, and basically the old elites who have lost their willpower allow him to come into power in the same way as the elites did with the case of Mussolini 11 years earlier. Shouldn't they have known better? 11 years later, Mussolini's still in power. Or how were the elites doing in Italy 11 years later? Just fine. There were no unions, there were no socialists, there were no communists, there were no radicals. Trains were running on time. And so even if Mussolini was unsavory and uh, not all that civilized as far as many of them were concerned, okay, so what? They were protected. And besides, the German elites knew that they were more intelligent than the Italians. That was assumed. That was a given. They would bring him in. They would use him. He would clean house. They would get rid of him if he did anything to really harm their basic interests. Germany probably should have had some kind of military dictatorship by 1933. Real democracy was no longer possible. Democracy was dead in Germany by 1931, 1932. The issue was whether or not it was going to be a national socialist dictatorship or some kind of older, older military authoritarian dictatorship of the old school. But they didn't really have any new ideas, and he had more control of the masses. And those masses did not suspect where he was really going to take him, take them. They didn't vote for him because he was anti-Semitic. Neither did they vote against him because he was anti-Semitic. But they, that's, that wasn't their basic issue. Their basic issue was German dignity, food, security, hope, recovery, a job. And OK, if there are too many Jews in Germany, so be it. We'll get them out. That was a side issue at that time. You could say, shouldn't they have known better with that alone? So what does it tell us? What does this whole time period tell us? It's a perfect storm, guys. It's a perfect storm. Once in a while, it happens. Everything goes wrong at one time. It's a perfect storm. People's values have been so distorted by World War I and by their fears that they couldn't. So take a look at these dates, and we'll take, it, take us through that to show you how he's able to get away with one thing like this after another. Questions? Yes? Yeah. Before you start, just a quick question. Yeah. This is something I don't know. Maybe you do, Bob. What kind of education did Adolf Hitler have? Where did he pick up? Was, was, it, was it just sort of uh, street anti-Semitism in, in, in Vienna? Uh, I mean, what, 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 where when did he get some of his? It was in the water. It was in the air. Anti-Semitism in Germany was like feelings against African Americans in America. And anti-Semitism in America at that time was higher than ever before, and in England also. But what I mean is, is it, is it just uh, everyday street uh, kind of... Uh, uh, no, it's even... Or, or did he have an education in which he, in which he pursued... He was a good student until his, uh, until his hormones began to work as a teenager. 
He came from a reasonable family with a, 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 a father who probably beat him up a good bit, a very repressive father. Uh, he did very well in school. He sang in the church choir. He sang. He was a chorister. He was the best student in his class for a while in elementary school. He went wacko during his high school years. Um, and he was an artist, an artist, artistic temperament, bohemian. Okay? A fa well, you know, we call him a failed artist. If you see his art, it ain't bad. He draw Is there anyone here? Who, I mean, uh, he would have been as good as any art student at Lafayette College easily at any time. But he wasn't good enough to get into the finest school in Austria. He considered it failure. He had lots of other opportunities, including a pension fund from his father, who was a bureaucrat. The other talent he had was, is public, uh, speaking talent. public speaking. I mean, he, 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 you know, he, it would have been cool to see pistols have gone between him and uh, Winston <laughs> Churchill. Uh, two different kinds of speakers. That's right. Guy. Yes, and the British audience would not have accepted his kind of speaking, and the German audience would have had trouble with because the, it, it's a kind of speaking for a particular culture. But he had talent, didn't he? Right. Well, my father actually saw him physically speaking in Germany in 1933. And he had, he was standing next to a university friend of his, and his friend was Jewish. And his friend looked up and said, my gosh, you know, this guy's got some good ideas. And my father's son turned to him. Did you just hear what he said about it? I mean, no, he was a mesmerizing. Jesus has a mesmerizing speech. Do you think he was as fully formed an anti-Semite in the beginning when he was scapegoating? Or did he come to believe it greater as he went along when he saw the success of it? He said it in Mein Kampf. He says it in Mein Kampf. It's all there. Yes. It's all there. Okay. It really is all there. In fact, it's all there earlier than Mein Kampf. Uh, he, says, uh, he says that um, if uh, we had taken 15,000 Jews or so, and put them on the front line and, and made sure they got gassed, we wouldn't have lost World War I. Okay? And the, the, uh, the, the craziness about all of that is that uh, his, his first Iron Cross came from a Jewish officer who, who decorated, <laughs> decorated Hitler. And uh, Jews served beyond their numbers in World War I. But it was not believed that they did so by the other German people. In fact, there was even an, an inquiry commission <coughs> on the service record of Jews in Germany during the war. And to take that further, Walter Rathenau was Jewish, and he was the head of the whole German munitions industry uh, reproduction. He kept them in the war in the beginning of the war uh, by being that particular person who put together all the munitions and made it function. He was later assassinated in 1923. It was all there. It was all there. It's all there. It's all there. This really got some, some appeal to a greater audience. Right, right. It was all there. It was common to the culture, not the murderous form, but the, the negativity was common to the culture in a murderous form with respect to some people, but he was the most radical of those people or among the very, very most radical of those people. And it didn't matter to him at first whether the Jews were sent to Madagascar or whether they were killed. It also didn't matter to him whether 10 or 50 million Poles were killed because they didn't have any value as people. Made a mistake, though, because there aren't 50 million Poles. There are only 30 million. <laughs> but there were some Poles living elsewhere, so maybe there are 35. <laughs> Someone in his family Jewish? No, that was a, um, there was adultery in the back of the family. The family tree had been adjusted uh, earlier, and, and a German scholar pretty much set that to rest about 20 years ago. But there, there was the belief, the rumor, that there may have been some Jewish blood in his family. This may be just a really basic question, but I can't figure it out. Was the, the anti-Semitism, like let's say in the late 1800s, was it just based on the fact that they were a different religion, or uh, what is the real root of, or is that just a huge that's, so that's uh, question? That's a huge question. That's a question that takes minimally a half hour, and it has to do with the whole nature of European culture. And for based religious, on religion, like the same way that first based on religion, all the way through the Reformation. Then you add economic issues, you add psychological issues, you add cultural issues. It was as basic to European culture as hatred and fear of blacks was to American culture. The Jews were the black people of Europe, together with the Sinti and the Roma. Because they're different, they're not us. 
Because they're different, they're not us, but not only are they different, they kill God. And therefore they, okay, they killed God, they poisoned the wells, they eat our children to make matzah. Uh, I mean, okay, look, uh, when, when I went cross country, I was asked by a naval uh, fellow uh, where my horns were. Uh, this is 1964 when we got married and we were friends. We, we went out together late at night. They talked about religion. We said we were Jewish. Where are your horns? I said, I, I take them out when I, I put them back on when I go home. Okay. This is serious. Okay. And, and so all of, and, and, the, and the further east you went, the worse it got. So the anti-Semitism in uh, the Ukraine, in, in, in Russia, in Poland, was much more visceral and much worse than the anti-Semitism in Germany. Okay? What you have is about 500,000 German Jews out of 65 million in Germany. In Poland, you've got 3.3 3, 3 million Jews out of 33 million people living in Poland. So there it's 10% of the population. And all hell was already breaking loose in the 1930s uh, against them. Uh, uh, once Marshal Pilsudski, who defended the Jews, died in 1937. Just deep-seated hatred. Deep. Visceral of the kind. Would, the, would, would educated people, you know. Like, Even like, educated people. That's the, oh, this is the worst part, okay? Hitler won in the universities. He didn't lose. He won among the students. He won among the faculty. He answered their grievances. He gave them a sense of hope. And Jews became too middle class too quickly and took too many important positions in society because they all steal it, okay? Too many journalists, too many doctors, too many lawyers, too many people doing well. They suffered through the inflation. They suffered through the depression. Didn't matter, okay? It was time to clean house and get rid of all these foreigners, all these aliens, so that pure Germans can work, or pure Poles, or pure Latvians, or Lithuanians, and they basically all did virtually the same thing once the German armies came are, are in. Are we going through that today? No, that's next year. <laughs> <laughs> was it true, though, that uh, Hitler's, the doctor who treated his yes. mother survived? Was Jewish. Was yes, he was protected. And he, and, so and he, more, he, more types of those? Um, the Nazis said everyone has their own favorite Jew, so we can't allow that. But Hitler allowed it once that we know of there. And other times he allowed it also, but only he could allow it. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, but this particular person actually had Hitler's paintings. And he wasn't a bad artist. He really was not a bad artist. It was common, but it was not, not bad at all. Okay, uh, sh do you want to keep going with questions or do you want to? It, it's your game. Your game, your game. Go, you keep going. Timeline. Timeline. You keep going. Timeline. Whoa. Timeline. All right. Um, so we're going to jump up. Gleichschau uh, Tung, that's internal coordination comes into power in 1933, regulates, coordinates everything. By the end of the first year, there are no more other political parties that are allowed. Even the old conservative parties go into abeyance, and he's got dictatorial powers by the end of 1933. In 1934, he kills these uh, 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 opponents of the army. That gives him even more support. And in 1935, he announces publicly that Germany is remilitarizing, breaks the basic structure of the Treaty of Versailles. Germany is going to remilitarize. I'm going back. Thank you. Now, um, de Gaulle wrote a book in 1934, Vers l'armée de métier, Toward the Professional Army. It was a brilliant book. He was not the only one who was thinking about these things. He thought the Maginot Line, which was already being fully constructed, was an inadequate defense system because no army should only have a defense system. Tanks are not supposed to stand still. They're supposed to go forward. If Germany does something wrong, how are we going to stop them from doing it? By sitting in our bunkers? Paul Renault was a conservative French politician who believed in de Gaulle's book. De Gaulle had dedicated his book to Marshal Pétain, the great marshal of World War I. De Gaulle believed in movable tanks, separate units, shock troops, 
small areas, small divisions that can respond to small problems and give you flexibility. Someone had asked for lessons, you always have to have flexibility. You can't put all your eggs in one basket, you must have flexibility. So Renault takes this to the French Parliament for discussion. De Gaulle has insulted the entire army upper elite. Minister of War gets up and says in Parliament with a straight face, when we have spent so many billions on our fortifications, and here comes one of my favorite quotes in all of history, who would believe us foolish enough to sally out in front of them in search of heaven knows what adventure? This is a general speaking. Who would believe us <coughs> foolish enough to sally out in front of them in search of heaven knows what adventure? That's the impact of World War I. The French army was so overwhelmed with the losses and the impact of World War I that they never wanted to fight an offensive war again. They wanted the German armies, if they came, to bleed to death on their fortifications while the French defended. Se défendre d'abord. First, defend yourself. World War I, attack à outrance. First, attack. How about doing both? That's all de Gaulle was saying. How about being able to do both? So the Germans read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and even more of them read Liddell Hart and General Fuller's book that were written in English that all said the same thing. And they implemented it. And the French could have had it in 1935 and did none of it. None of it. Okay? So now Hitler has begun to build his army, announced the existence of his air force, and next it's going to be the Rhineland. He's going to remilitarize the Rhineland in March of 1936. Now, by March of 1936, if they had adapted de Gaulle's proposals, they had the tanks. They just had to use them differently. It's not that the French weren't building stuff. They could have had a way of responding to the remilitarization of the Rhineland without total mobilization. Hitler remilitarizes the Rhineland, the British say to the French, don't do anything. Appeasement. What was appeasement? The belief that Hitler could be appeased. Is there anything wrong with appeasement? No. If the person could be appeased. But Hitler couldn't be appeased. Well, how do you know? Some British believed in passive appeasement. Some British believed in active appeasement. Chamberlain believed in active appeasement. Put all the food in the plate and say, which piece do you want to eat? Everything. Anything you give me, of course. And male ox, too. Uh, so what happens is the British say to the French, don't do anything. We have all the meetings of the French uh, cabinet. The politicians say to the generals, what plans do you have ready to stop him in the Rhineland? The generals say none. Complete mobilization in the middle of the Depression. Who's going to take the risk of complete mobilization when your ally is telling you we're not going with you during this time period either? We don't want you to do anything. Complete mobilization. One of my favorite quotes, the French do nothing. Hitler becomes the most popular man by far in Germany. The generals come to believe he's got the brains He's got straight, strong legs. Theirs are shaky. And if this is what he can bring home for no cost, then he's the man. So what does René Albrecht Carrier say about the Rhineland, which most scholars believe was the last chance of possibly getting rid of Hitler without a major war? He says, France had effective power of her own 
that in the last resort she could have used alone. At that moment, France was still mistress of her choice. That choice was abdication. It's still her responsibility to defend herself. He had broken every treaty that existed. He had really changed the balance of power. The French do not act. And then what does René Albrecht Carrier say later in the same chapter? And the United States was wondering whether or not we are part of this world. Well, he was an older fellow, and he really came from that generation, and it hit him in the gut, and he had to just get it in. But we also were glad that nothing happened at that time, and the world did not slip into war at that time. One more comment, then I'm going to uh, take your question. Did Hitler uh, count on the French being that way, or yes. did he just figure he was going to beat him anyway? No, he counted on the French being that way. That his army was not fully ready at all. His generals were terrified. It was a big risk. Hitler said, it fell from heaven. I'm a man of fate. Couldn't believe the result that it got away that easily. But he just felt it was the right way to go. And in fact, it wasn't even a surprise. The French didn't think it was going to happen in March. They thought it was going to happen later in the year. Their ambassador was writing home saying, this is the next step. We've got to be ready for it. We, gotta, we can't allow it. Okay. The people who should have been governing France at that time, the people who should have been leading the French army at that time, were buried in Verdun and Flanders and elsewhere. Okay? They were the soldiers who had died, and they were fighting the last war. And they, Mark Bloch, there's a wonderful book by Mark Bloch uh, called Strange Defeat, and it was written while he was in the resistance in 1940. And he said that the ultimate reason why we lost World War II was mental failure. The Germans purely outsmarted us. They thought creatively they were the loser. They changed their tactics. We sat on our hands. It was mental failure. Then he gives a whole other series of reasons. But the most important from this great historian's mind, and he was tortured to death by the Gestapo, was mental failure. Then it gets worse. The Spanish Civil War, you'll love it. Who cares? Well, 500,000 people who died, another 300,000 people who became refugees. So what happens in Spain? There's a popular front government in Spain in 1936, just as there is in France, composed of the same groups, communists, socialists, Democrats versus the extreme right wing and the right wing. They are more radical. The army rebels. The civil war breaks out. Troops from Morocco start fighting in Spain. Germany and Italy send weapons and try out their weapons in Spain. Guernica in 1937 is obliterated. Picasso then does the painting. The British and the French there's an embargo. They're not supposed to send weapons. The Italians and the Germans sign the embargo, publicly flaunt it. The Russians send weapons to the Popular Front government. The Germans and the Italians really try out their tanks and planes and troops on the side of the right wing. And the French sit on their hands with their own Popular Front government. Why? because they're afraid of sliding into war with Hitler, and even more, they're afraid that civil war will break out in France. If the French government aids the left against the right, that in France the right will go into rebellion, carrying much of the army, and France will have a civil war. This is 1936. That's how divided society was. A proxy war then in Spain. And Spain becomes a proxy war between the Axis and the rest, especially the Russians. And Italy and Hitler get drawn to, into each other's bosom. And then they meet with Japan and do the same thing and sign an anti common turn pact in 1937. And the whole thing is getting tighter. But now everybody can look in the newspaper and see what cities look like when they're bombed. Okay, they can see what cities look like when they're bombed, and they know 
that London will be bombed if there is a war. And they know that Paris will be bombed if there is a war. And things get made worse. 1937, we already talked a little bit about Mr. Chamberlain. Mr. Chamberlain uh, is a believer in active appeasement. Give him the plate and tell him what to take. No, I'm exaggerating. Mr. Chamberlain, however, believes that he is powerful enough to deal with Hitler. That if Hitler's grievances are taken care of, Hitler has to be a man of peace. After all, he was a soldier in World War I. Hitler keeps on saying he's a man of peace. All he cares about is German dignity. He is a man of peace. And Chamberlain puts it all on the table and lets Hitler know that the British would not be so upset if Hitler did the following things as long as he does it peacefully and not by using weapons. So Hitler now knows he's got an ally in England who won't support the French. And by the way, during the Popular Front government, the British said in their own documents, in some cases, they preferred the government in Italy and Germany to lay on bloom socialists in France. Again, that Reformation ideology, the hatred and fear even of moderate socialism versus extreme fascism. Why? Because the people of property, if they weren't Jewish and they weren't communist and they weren't radical and they kept their mouth shut, all the people of property are living better in Germany under Hitler. Business is doing just fine. Okay? So they could live with it. They were willing to live with these people. March of 1938, Hitler annexes Austria. Well, after all, they're only Germans eight, nine million additional people make good soldiers. They were excellent as SS people. They volunteered. Because, see, they missed the first six years. They had to catch up. So they volunteered. Hitler goes into Vienna. Tears are strolling down his face. And he says, yes, a good political action saves lives. 76,000 people are arrested in the next couple of weeks and put in camps. Look at the map. What do we have here? Three and a half million Germans in the Sudetenland in a pincer. March or, or September of 1938. Um, Hitler makes it clear that this situation has to be dealt with immediately. Chamberlain in the summer of 38 says the mere use, the mere threat of the use of the force is a danger to the peace of Europe. They all have the alliances to Czechoslovakia. France has an alliance. The Russians have an alliance. Czechoslovakia uh, is the only democratic state left in the center of Europe. It has a modern military. It has border fortifications. They let it go. Munich, September 1938, Czechoslovakia is given or rather, the Sudeten land is given. This is the last of the freebies. And I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, but this is the last of the freebies. March of 1939, what does Hitler do? He marches into the rest of Czechoslovakia. So what? What's the problem? The problem is there aren't any more Germans there. Before this, he was saying, all I want is all of these foreign Germans brought back to the bosom of the Reich. But these are Slavs. And now it becomes clear as a flash that what Hitler intends to do is dominate all of Europe. Okay, And all the assumptions of appeasement Go down the tubes. Looking at all of this, suppose you were sitting in Russia, and first you see this, this, then you see this, then you see this, then you see demands for this, and you've been omitted from all discussions. What do you think? Stalin thought the West was trying to get Hitler to attack the Soviet Union. 
Well, Hitler's not too small for big things. All those horrible things he was saying about Jewish Bolshevism. Stalin fires his Jewish foreign minister, Litvinov. He replaces him with Molotov. Germany and Russia start negotiating. August 1939, Nazi-Soviet pact, signal for war, this time with Germany and Russia together against Poland and the West hanging out, having lost all of this initiative. Six and a half years from the depths of the Depression to dominance in Europe, the only ones paying the price, the liberals, the Democrats, the communists, the socialists, the Jews in Germany, no military force used. You always have to consider your worst case scenarios. This was not an easy world to play in. This was a perfect storm. The French have a distinguished military history of fighting and defending themselves and conquering everybody else. After all, they dominated Europe from 1650 through Napoleon. Okay? Where did you ever get a selection of French generals like these people? Never in all of French history. The British? An island? Conquering half the world? Where did you ever get British political leaders and diplomats as blind as they were during this time period. And Adolf Hitler, a corporal, running Germany, telling generals what to do? Impossible. Perfect story. All came together. And then he began the war, and then it got out of control, and he went too far. What I didn't realize until the uh, gathering storm is that Hitler had an interest, I mean, Mussolini had an interest in Austria. Sure. And if they had played their cards right, right, they could have had Italy as an ally. Could have had Italy as an ally if they had played their cards right or if Italy had played its cards right. Because Austria is a buffer between Germany and Italy. The Italians don't want to be bordering the Germans. Yes. What kept Spain out of the war? Intelligence. <laughs> uh, geography. Hitler said, oh, the, Hitler said he would rather go to a series of dentists than ever meet Franco again. He tried, <laughs> he tried so hard to get Franco to enter the war. Franco owed Hitler so much. But he just kept saying, all right, you give me this amount of tanks, this amount of oil, this amount of this, and this amount of that, and this amount of that, and then we'll think about it. <laughs> so Franco. Franco. Yeah. Franco survived into the 70s. Yes. Yes, he did. Yes. Yeah. How much did uh, Japan's role with the Allies in World War I embolden them from World War II? Well, it emboldened them a lot because they saw how powerful they were with respect to the others. But this is a series of a whole series of things of defeating China in 1894, defeating Russia in 1905. Uh, they went through a whole series of steps in which they became a great power. And the West didn't really understand and fathom it until later. Partly because of racial understandings. Wasn't Germany silly? Have declared war against the oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It brought us in a good couple of months earlier. A good few months earlier. It might have taken a whole half a year longer or who knows what. Uh, Hitler, Hitler that's, that's when he undresses. What the hell? I'm declaring war on those people. Yes. Uh, Churchill's book. Yes. Um, he's quoting a lot of primary sources and his quotes support his arguments, but it is, is the book at all self-serving? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there are actually, I, as an undergraduate, when I studied the Rhineland crisis, I actually found places in which he wasn't telling the truth, where he was saying that he had taken a position six months to a year earlier than he had taken the position when it ended up being the right position. And then I read the parliamentary debates. That's not what he said. 
Um, yes, and then we'll come over here. Uh, Is President here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday, uh, your end, you kind of philosophized. What I was thinking when you started today, you were saying the, the split dichotomy of liberalism and uh, conservatism. Uh, is there any connection to today in our country and yes, and it's scary. Bankruptcy in yes, Europe? and it's scary. Yeah. But yes, and I and I, I plead and worry about our country because it's not really a country; it's an empire. Okay. But once again, we're and to have stayed together and done what we've done is is a marvel. Why did we ever let the euro be created? Well, that 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 was for the Europeans. It wasn't a bad thing. It's it's what you do with it, not. That, that's a pretty good thing. You know what's a good thing? And I'll, I'll end here. A good thing is going to breakfast in Strasbourg and going to lunch in the little German city right across the bridge without having to show a passport. That is a good thing. So if you want to feel a little bit better after these two commentaries that I've given in this discussion we've had, if you want to feel a little bit better, okay, Europe has come very very far since World War II. Well, there no, are I'm, some I'm positive talking developments. about the economic situation. <laughs> sure. So far, <laughs> but with, with all of it, they're living better than they've ever lived before. The real issue is can we continue to do so, and let's hope we can.